So hello, everybody. It's uh, very nice to see all of you who join us to this uh, workshop. Uh, even if it happens through the screen and not directly here in Stockholm, the great arrangement team are very excited and happy to welcome all the participants to this workshop. My name is Ken Benson. I'm a full professor in Spanish literature at the Department of Romance Language and Classics at the Faculty of Humanities in Stockholm University. And I'm very happy and I'm very proud to welcome you to this workshop. And of course, it's a pity that we cannot be together in the lovely library of NILAS. NILAS is the Nordic Institute of Latin American Studies, where it, would, it, it was planned to, to have this event in the beginning, uh, which is part of the department together with four uh, Romance languages. Apart from Spanish and Portuguese, we have French and Italian as well, and two classic languages ancient Greek and uh, Latin. Nilas is mostly focused on uh, social sciences in Latin America and the combination of language, literature and social sciences is crucial for our department. And of course, the Nordic Institute specially reinforce the connections within, within languages and literatures in Spanish, Portuguese and on a smaller scale also in French because of the Caribbean. The Nordic dimension of the Institute implicate that we have a board with scholars representatives from all the Nordic countries, Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden, with intention to reinforce Latin American studies in the Nordic countries, as it is the only remaining Institute in the Nordic countries where the former institutes, uh, institutes are now included in organizations that have to do uh, with, with the whole planet, with the global. And of course, the theme for this workshop, cultural responses to climate change and the unthinkable from Latin America and the global South cannot be studied without a global perspective. But at the same time, it is important to have a special focus on the characteristics of the actual region and culture to respond to the challenges of the climate change here and now. As a region rich in natural resources, the situation for Latin America is more extreme in this neoliberal imperialism, capitalism, and globalizations of our days. Stockholm University's Faculty of Humanities has since a time ago special resources for leading research areas, and the studies of the global literature is one of these fields. And we must thank the Faculty of Humanities for the support to implement this workshop and to have the possibility to invite Professor Gisela Hefes from Rice University to reinforce this area of studies at our department during this spring term. I will soon, uh, soon return to Gisela when I present her as the first introducing panelist. With her and uh, the young fellows, uh, uh, Azucena Castro and Gianfranco Selgas, and of course, with the interest of all of you uh, to these workshops, the climate change are going to be analyzed and discussed from multiple cultural perspectives. I'm convinced that there will be very exciting interactions during these two very intensive uh, working days. Azucena, Gianfranco, and myself will be available level during these two days. Uh, so just contact us through the function email address we have for the uh, event. And it's the same way that we have been in touch so far. So we can quickly answer uh, your uh, question, uh, the question that you may have. I remind you that uh, you must register for each of the three panelists, which are arranged as webinars. Uh, there are three presentations will be about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we will have the opportunity to ask questions and or comments to the panelists uh, through the Q&A or through the chat. And uh, we will select questions uh, to the panelists. Uh, the last one, uh, which is by uh, Igor Barreto from Universidad Central de Venezuela, will be in Spanish and consists in a pre-recorded speech. We, we did so to be sure that the connection is good, but anyway, Igor will be connected with us so we can make questions uh, to him as well after he speak uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, 
The two other plenary lecturers by Gisela Hefes, now soon, and by Victoria Saramago from the University of Chicago will be held in English as well as the closure of the workshop after Igor Barreto's intervention. I now take the opportunity to specially thank Gisela, Victoria, and Igor for accepting to be our guests of honor. In this closure, uh, we'll return to the possibility of publishing your presentations. So I hope that all of you will join us for discuss this point and others before we finish and say goodbye to each other for this time. As you have seen in the program, we'll have, we have two links, A and B, for the parallel sessions. I remind you that each presentation must not exceed 15 minutes so we have plenty of time at the end for discussions. So in these uh, sessions, uh, you use the function raise hand if you uh, want to intervene at the, at the end and the moderators will distribute the word after the two, three or four participants that uh, after their presentations. Of course, during the presentations, of uh, uh, the parallel sessions, all of you have to mute uh, the microphones and only unmute them when the moderators gives you the word. Unfortunately, we have received a late cancellation by Martina Bronner in the parallel session six about cinematic ecologies tomorrow at 14.30. Consequently, this session will be postponed to 14.45, and you have the opportunity to participate in the other session during the first 15 minutes. If there would be other late changes, we will notify you through the email and you have, uh, that you have provided us, uh, if, but we are not going to change the schedule and the times uh, that we have in the program. So we can be safe with that. I would also like to remind you that we have arranged a program item in addition to the academic program to end today's event at 18.45 local Swedish time. It is about a recorded music and dance number specifically made for our workshop. So I hope that everyone can join in and enjoy this special event. As it is a music number, the language won't be a barrier. Remember that you'll use the link A to connect to this special event this afternoon. And with that, I warmly welcome you all and declare our workshop open. Looking forward to very interesting presentations and discussion and discussions during these two days. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And now it's just a minute before we have the time for the first keynote speaker. So I will proceed to introduce her quite immediately. I wait one minute if it would be someone. Now it is exactly 13.00. So I'm very honored to introduce our first keynote speaker, Professor Gisela Hefes. And we must uh, congratulate her for having achieved the rank of full professor uh, only some weeks ago. Congratulations, Gisela. Hefes is a very well-known name within the eco-critic field with a special focus on Latin America. After getting her licenciatura en letras at uh, Universidad de Buenos Aires, well known as UBA, she has been working in the States, uh, first at Yale University, where she took her PhD in Latin American literature about 14 years ago. She began her career as an associate assistant professor uh, at the University of Oklahoma directly after the defense of her thesis. And since 2009, she has been at Rice University, first as an assistant professor between 2009 and two, uh, 2014, and then as an associate professor, and now since May 2021 20, as a full professor. 
Gisela is a very interdisciplinary researcher and has several affiliations, as for example, the Jewish Studies Program, the Medical Humanities Minor, and last but absolutely not least for this workshop at the Center for Energy and Environmental Research in the Human Sciences. I'm not going to name all her publications, they are really too many, but I would like to refer to the very last ones. And uh, uh, recently she has published the book, uh, Toxic Nature, Mutated Bodies and Alterated Landscapes in Contemporary Southern Cone Narratives and Cinema and Politics of Destruction, Poetics of Preservation, which uh, came out uh, the last year in Rutlesh and before in a Spanish version, Políticas de la Destrucción, Poéticas de la Preservación, Apuntes para una Lectura Ecocrítica del Medio Ambiente en América Latina in 2015. During the spring term, Gisela has been an invited researcher at our department and our, at our university and collaborated with plenty of activities within education, PhD studies, research and dissemination. We sincerely hope that this is just the beginning of a long-term collaboration as not only your knowledge, but your human qualities with students, researchers, PhD students, as well as your accuracy, stringency, your new readings of tradition and contemporary literature, and not least your commitment with the future of our planet and the intimate relationship between culture, nature, and social issues makes that when we know you better now, that we will not uh, let you go. <laughs> but uh, we feel that you now, Gisela, are one more of the team in Nilas and uh, Stockholm University. We sincerely hope that uh, we'll soon be, we'll be able to have this collaboration within our campus, which is placed in a natural reserve outside Stockholm, that I'm sure that you will appreciate, especially in the spring and summer times. So Gisela, very welcome to have the first plenary session, which have the title Extracted Landscapes and Decapitation Resistance, Activism, Violence and Imaginaries of Disposition in Latin America. Gisela, the screen is yours. Thank you, Ken. Thank you so much for, for the kind uh, words. Actually, I was going to say that I am very thankful to the Department of Roman Studies and Classics, and especially you and Azucena Castro and Gianfranco Segas because of uh, the really warm welcoming that you all of you gave me. And of course, the other members of the department and uh, people from the Environmental Humanities Network, as well as the students I had the chance to meet. I'm going to uh, first uh, share the screen. So I'm just, I will take a, just a second. So I'm going to get started. Uh, so this uh, presentation is actually based on an article that I just published um, on undisciplined knowledge and decapitation resistance. Uh, the article came out in the volume I co-edited with Caroline Fornoff entitled Pushing Past the Human in Latin American Cinema. Uh, technology, technology, it can be argued, creates miracles. Who would believe that mountains could drift away, come closer into view, or even vanish? Because of modern extractive mechanisms, as well as the use of cutting edge gear today, we are witnessing the spectacle of removal. In the last two decades, Latin American cinema has brought a landscape of decapitated mountains into view. Mountains with no head, with their top chopped off, bold and bare like the head of a Dominican friar. This violent landscape reproduces itself in various and multiple scenarios, from the Andes in Argentina to the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia. 
I use the term decapitated acknowledging the ferocity of its meaning, but more importantly, to, direct, to directly address the violence embedded in the images of what Sunaura Taylor has defined as disabled ecologies. This is the webs of disability that are created spatially, temporarily, and across species boundaries when ecosystems are contaminated, depleted, and profoundly altered. Decapitated mountains entail the violence of a spectacle, the degradation of magnificent landscapes, this, the curtail of living organisms, a visual spectacle that depicts how thousands of bodies, humans and non-humans alike, are wounded daily and gratis for no apparent reason except the ongoing machinery put into practice by the capital of sin. Specifically, I refer here to a well-known reason, coal, copper, gold, and silver. All of these precious commodities, except for coal, have an ongoing demand in the current markets of this globalized era. Let's take, for example, gold mining. As Joan Martin, Martinez Allier suggests in Environmentalism of the Poor, this type of mining is similar in a way to shrimp farming or to the extraction of tropical wood like mahogany or to exports of ivory and diamonds from Africa. About 80% of all gold that is dug out of the ground ends up as jewelry. Consumption or the wish to obtain positional goods is a more culturally than biologically driven phenomenon. Gold mining is particularly destructive. At the, at the mine, daily dynamite explosions break up gold, which is, which is then piled onto larger, large filter pads to be sprayed 24 hours a day with a cyanide solution. Sodium cyanide used in gold mines can kill fish and cause of other ecological damage. As Martinez Ayer argues, gold mining pollutes not only the rivers downstream, but also local water sources. While the cyanide technique has been used as an alter alternative to amalgamation with mercury, consisting of spraying a solution of cyanide over crushed or kept into open piles, mercury is also used. In 2002, In 2002, a truck traveling from the Yanacocha gold mine in northern Peru spilled 150 kilograms, which equals to 330 pounds of liquid mercury along a 27 kilometer stretch of a highway traversing the towns of Choropampa, Magdalena, and San Jose. It is worth noting that Yanacocha is South America's largest gold mine. As Fabiana Lee noted, until the spill, local people had not been aware that mercury is a byproduct of the gold mining process since the company had not made this information public. It was not until then that the potential risk of modern mining were made evident. As a result, children and adults came into contact with mercury and because of this, because this happened before the town was warned of the potential toxic, toxic risk, more than 750 people sought medical aid and more than 100 people ended up in the hospital with mercury poisoning. The Churupampa spill brought into public question how mining companies, in this case, Minera Yanacocha, handle their daily operations. Although extractive corporations usually insist that their procedures are safe and do not create pollution or negatively impact the environment, gold mining leaves behind enormous ecological rucksacks along with pollution from mercury or cyanide and brings about immense damage on both humans and non-humans beings alike. 
In addition to pollution, to polluting the water supply, mining reduces the flow of water in irrigation canals. Coal mining is primarily undertaken on indigenous lands. In his seminal book, Slow Violence and Environmentalism of the Poor, Rob Nixon establishes a relationship between environmental violence and displacement from what he calls the vernacular landscape. This landscape refers to a place shaped by the effective historically textured maps that communities have devised over generations. Maps repeat with names and routes, maps alive to significant ecological and surface geological features. Furthermore, these landscapes are integral to community socio-ecological dynamics. The official landscape of the extractive state is oblivious to these maps and instead examines and inspects the land in a bureaucratic, externalizing and extraction driven manner that is often ruthlessly instrumental. Martinez Salia points out that by violating land rights, mining companies as well as other extractive industries are denying the right to life of local peoples whose relationship to land is central to their spiritual identity and survival. In Latin America, many indigenous territories are located either in the mountains or its surrounding areas. One example is Ausangate. Peruvian anthropologist Marisol de la Cadena in her much cited article, Indigenous Cosmopolitics in the Andes, refers to an episode that took place in December 2006, when more than 1,000 peasants gathered in Cusco's main square, the Plaza de Armas. They had traveled from their villages located at the foot of a mountain named Ausangate, well known in Cusco as a powerful earth being, the source of life and death of wealth and misery. To attain positive results, local dwellers of the village Cultivate, cultivate and maintain a fulfilling relationship with the mountain and its environment, including surrounding mountains as well as minor or apparently less significant entities. This, is, this excursion to the Plaza de Armas was to join other demonstrators. A multitude of worshippers, both Catholic and of the sanctuary of Coilu Rit, Coilu Rit, more importantly, they were there to protest the potential concession of a mine in the Sinacara. They are well known as Oilurit, which means star of snow, or Oiluriti, which means shining white snow. The largest pilgrimage center in southern Peru where tons of thousands of people flock every day. The mountains have to have to the Indian people sacred attributes. Ausangate is the apple, which means in Quechua, the lord and owner of the region. Whether they're part of Pachamama, the apples, those powerful mountains, deities, have personalities in their own right. They can be male or female. They are the custodians of eternal snow and ice, of the life-sustaining water, of wild and domesticated animals, and they also watch over people's actions. Similarly to Pachamama, they may penalize or grant requests. Ausangate, the documentary also named after this mountain, came out in 2006, the same year of the episode to which Marisol de la Cadena referred in her article. Because of the overlap between its release and the demonstration, both happening simultaneously, the documentary does not dwell on the threat of the mountain's potential decapitation by a mining company, nor does it draw attention to any of the conflicts referred to by De La Cadena. The film suggests by way of a long establishing shot that Ausangate is a sacred region. The use of sound, mainly music, overlap with a woman explaining in Quechua what Ausangate means for her community, in place that this region represents a sanctuary for both the villagers and the Quechua people. The documentary is not explicitly environmental per se, or even political, 
but it acquires such a level of significance by presenting the daily customs of the people and the relationship they have established with the mountains, the apple for generations. The communal lifestyle of the people bluntly contrasts with the individualist life of the modern city. For the villagers, those who seek a job in the urban spaces are moving away from their ancestors' values and therefore from Ausangate. Marisol de la Cadena's argument, however, is not political, but about politics. It is more about the interplay of conflicting powers within the society than about the space for the contestation of the very basis of power. In indigenous cosmopolitics, she draws inspiration from recent political events in Peru and to lesser extent in Ecuador and Bolivia, where the indigenous popular movement has introduced sentient entities, mountains, water, and soil, what Western epistemologists call nature, into the public political arena, arena to argue that indigeneity as a historical formation exceeds the notion of politics as usual. That is an arena populated by rational human beings disputing the power to represent others vis-a-vis -vis the state. According to De La Cadena, in indigenity's current political emergence challenges the separation of nature and culture that underpins the prevalent notion of politics and its consequent social contract. Therefore, current indigenous movements propose a different political practice, plural, not because of its enactment by bodies marked by gender, race, ethnicity, or sexuality as multiculturalism would have it, but because they conjure up non-humans as actors in the political arena. Ausangate and the sanctuary of Hoilur, Reed, are not the only earth beings to have become public politically. Also in Northern Peru, a coalition of peasants and environmentalists made Cerro Puilish a sacred mountain and enlisted it in the fight against the Anacocha. Although, as De La Cadena remarks, not each of the mining conflicts proliferating in Peru articulates the presence of earth beings, these struggles were enough to lead former Peruvian president Alan Garcia to describe sacred mountains as an invention of all anti-capitalist communist of the 19th century who change into protectionist in the 20th century and have again changed into environmentalist in the 21st century. Latin America cultural representations have come to play a pivotal role in the call for integrating a plurality of forms of life that are not limited to the human. Three documentaries that came out between 2007 and 2010 address the problem of mining exploration and extractive politics in three different mountainous regions of Latin America. Each film operates as a critical tool that combines environmental justice claims, indigenous and non-indigenous activism, and modes of social and cultural resistance that range from struggle and street demonstrations to blocking roads and placing pickets to collective ass assemblies assemblies. I contend that this film set in motion what I call decapitation resistance. By this, I refer to a strategy based on the use of alternative knowledges that dispute and aim to reverse the epistemological mechanisms established, established by mining companies and extractive capital. Decapitation resistance implies an undisciplined knowledge. One does not necessarily hark back to the Lacadena's ontological politics, for instance, by conjuring up exclusively the presence of earth beings. On the contrary, undisciplined knowledge challenges both hegemonic and homogenizing discourses by putting forward a heterogeneous hybrid episteme an episteme that binds together spaces and temporalities, modern and traditional customs, and material and digital risk assessments to generate collective action. 
resistance. Through the aesthetic production of documentary films, this episteme organized a unique practice that brings together human-driven anthropogenic change, politics, and environmentalism. The documentaries analyzed here appeal to this form of undisciplined knowledge to contest the imposition of the official landscape. The ultimate goal of decapitation resistance is to preserve and in some case restore the threatened vernacular landscape. Cielo Abierto Open Sky by Carlos Ruiz was released in 2007 when Clouds Clear by Danielle Bernstein and Anne Slick came out in 2008, and Operación Diablo, The Devil Operation by Stephanie Boyd in 2010. As Roberto Forn's project suggests, these films are examples of an eco-cinema that operates as a collaborative initiative. According to Belinda Smale, this type of practice, practice creates a reciprocal social agenda among filmmakers, technicians, and main actors. One that goes beyond empathy and generates a recognition of the other in its specificity through a dissident case that arises from the civic capacity to question the base of the political state. Thematically, the three documentaries embody what an article from The Economist on February 6, 2016, referred to as slicing off the mountain tops. The figurative image used in the article cor corresponds exactly with the growing phenomenon where Andean mountains are at risk of being decapitated. The three documentaries address ongoing conflicts in Latin America since the 1990s, when Andean countries opened their economies to private investment through neoliberal policies and deregulation. As a result, there was a rise of extractive practices through open pit mining that involved slicing the top of mountains or emptying lakes. Each documentary details a specific case study. Operación Diablo focuses on the resistance of the people of Huilish, Cajamarca, and the persecution that activists suffer in the hands of paramilitary groups hired by the company. Operación Diablo introduces the problem of gold mining and the response by the inhabitants who live in the region, who take on an activist role comprising political resistance, radical protest, and collective meetings. Because of the immediate threat to their vernacular landscape, they're forced to learn in greater detail about the perils of mining, a task they achieve by connecting with other communities. More precisely, their research is focused on the risk mining poses to their families and their environments. Cielo Abierto takes place in La Rioja, Argentina, where a Canadian mining company, Barricol Corporation, plans to explore the Famatina mountain in search of gold. The documentary features the local population of Famatina and Chilecito, both in the province of La Rioja, Argentina, who resist the establishment of open cut mining. Following the inhabitants of Famatina's surrounding areas, it draws attention to a growing political turmoil that ends with the expulsion of the company and the approval of the Ley Provincial, which forbids this type of mining, but ends up ignored by the local authorities. When Clouds Clear takes place in Junin, Ecuador, where a community of farmers who have been living in the mountains raising crops for many years have to confront the Canadian mining firm Ascendant Copper. The foreign company claims to own a large section of farmland that, is, that it intends to use to bring minerals to the surface. The three documentaries illustrate the ongoing tensions between local residents and transnational corporations by foregrounding the complexity that local authorities established with foreign firms, whom, ironically, they assist in suppressing local dissidents through force and violence. These take the form of repressive crowd dispersal or even more brutal actions, such as in Operación Diablo, where the audience witnesses how a paramilitary squad 
hired by the company, tortures and kills many locals. Yet this is not surprising. An article in Nature Sustainability indicated that between 2002 and 2017, 1,558 people in 50 countries were killed for defending their environments and lands. Conflicts over natural resources are linked to different materials and or sectors. For example, fossil fuels, minerals, timber, agriculture, aquaculture, and water, as well as access to land and or bodies of water from which natural resources can be extracted. These conflicts, as a matter of fact, can be seen as a continuation of colonial land and resource appropriation that established systems of dispossession and control. From Chico Mendes in Brazil to Berta Cáceres in Honduras, Enviro environmental activists have been repeatedly, repeatedly murdered in Latin America. Other murder activists include Vicente Cañas and Wilson Pinedo, both in Brazil, for protecting the Amazon rainforest as well as the indigenous land. Jeanette Cahuas in Honduras for protecting the land from the construction of the dam and a palm plantation. These documentaries play an important role in interrogating the contrasts that emerge from the clash of the local and the global. Decapitation resistance means to contest or even reverse the demonizing rhetoric used by the local media to describe the activist. This demonizing rhetoric depicts protesters as criminals, terrorists, guerrilleros, and or anti-state militants. Pacific marches that block the roads to the mine, like in When Clouds Clear, and with the police firing tear gas to brutally repress demonstrators. The two images featured here, C, figure one and two, provide a closer glimpse of the police force in two distinct situations. While figure one frames the cover police face with tight close up, figure two displays police presence by way of a medium shot of one officer accompanied by three other officers in the background. What is striking about figure one is its enactment of perverse intimacy with state power and violence. The image doesn't display police violence per se, but the helmet, gas mark, the bulletproof vest suggests the disproportionate response by the police force to peaceful protesters. Significant too is the choice of a close-up that highlights the officer's eyes, which can be seen through the clear plastic of the mask. The intimacy of this shot perhaps serves as a way of communicating the search for an emotional clue hidden under the bulky suit. Figure two, by contrast, departs from such intimacy and leaves less room for ambiguity. The still captures the one dimensional anger of the police officer, his hand pulling the gun, while the other three men look behind them to where the conflict will unfold. Farther in the distance, a local bystander can be seen. Examined together, the two images generate an effect of anger and frustration in the audience. Moreover, they illustrate the problematic tensions that define and organize a relentless conflict. Assembled side by side, they subvert the prevailing narrative that foreign corporations, mining companies, and the local states orchestrate in tandem. Together, the three documentaries index the similarity of tactics used by mining companies throughout different Latin American countries. Remarkably, the strategies employed by transnational corporations in three different countries, Argentina, Ecuador, and Peru, are almost identical. In all of them, we observe the same mechanisms of bribery and or intimidation. First, the, represent, the representative intends to bribe the members of the community by offering textbooks and color markers to teachers and mothers, promising to build them a school. 
When bribery doesn't work, we watch the never ending harassment and intimidation of the activist. It is important to emphasize that these protests are not propelled by anti-capitalist or xenophobic motifs. On the contrary, they are driven by the pursuit of the right to a healthful land in which to live. In a strict sense, the documentaries register the efforts of the local residents to organize, mobilize, and empower themselves and take charge of their own lives, communities, and environments. The protest captured on screen set in motion a process that James Halston, paraphrasing Henry Lefebvre, defines as not the right to the city, but the right to the land. While focused on the dispossess of global urbanization, Halston's call for an insurgency that arises when we follow the development of struggles over daily life and when it emerges in similar circumstances of degradation and peripheralness. Of course, it is not my intention here to equate a rural environment with an urban one. However, from an environmental justice standpoint that argues for making visible the disproportionate effects on poor and low income communities of the negative side effect of extractive capitalism, it is important to emphasize the common de denominator of a community at risk of displacement and of losing the right to a meaningful and healthful life. In different ways, both with losing their vernacular place as a result of real estate development, gentrification, and the effects of global financial institutions or of multinational extractive companies' operations. The insurgent notion of right underscores that these communities are entitled to claim and demand what belongs to them. Insurgent because they collide directly with those procedures carried out by transnational companies in complicity with the local authorities. Furthermore, they contend with and resist narratives of nation states and social, economic, and cultural development that justify decapitation. A shot in Cielo Abierto evinces these contradictions. The documentary displays an, as, as an assembly that takes place between the local people of La Rioja and government representatives to discuss the potential effects of mining extraction in Famatina. Interestingly, the delegates are accompanied by experts who argue that mining will bring economic and cultural development to the town. This idea of development, not as much as a, as a sustainable well being and balance among thriving natural human and social beings, but as environmental degradation is questioned by a villager attending the assembly. His response is definitive. He argues that the same mining company in the Argentina, Argentine province of San Juan has destroyed the Camino del Inca, one of the most valuable cultural references to the pre-Columbian era. In the three documentaries, the local population becomes an agent of social transformation and a model of political resistance. These films embody the Latin American practice of collective filmmaking in their combination of the genre's two features identified by Sophia McLennan, a commitment to making film with and for a marginal, marginalized community and a desire to alter mainstream commercial filmmaking practices. The concept of the collective means then that the filmmakers intended to collaborate with the communities they were filming by soliciting their contributions, involvement, and participation, while simultaneously eluding as much as possible the imposition of their own ideas on their subjects. Through, their, through this practice of collaboration in which the process is connected in an organic manner to the final product, collective filmmaking is attentive to the dynamics of power. By doing so, they hope to evade social and economic power structures that are frequent in both Hollywood and auteur cinema. There is an attempt to dissolve both fixed and ranked categories through the use of cinematic techniques that convey the filmmaker's position. 
from frequent sequences that show anti-mining families marching in protest to the handheld camera moving inside the crowd, allowing it to take the demonstrator's perspective as they block the roads to the mine, such as we see in When Clouds Clear, where they're eventually brutally repressed by the police. The use of montage and of still photos is another mechanism that mixes together characters, space, spaces, and temporalities, as well as the use of documented footage from the media, which overlaps with the portrayed events. In Indianizing film, Freya Shiwi analyzes similar strategies in documentaries such as Jorge San Ginés and the Ucamao group El Coraje del Pueblo, Courage of the People, from 1971. This film was produced in close collaboration with the mining community of Siglo XX in the Bolivian Andes and recreates a history of Bolivia's largely Quechua and Aymara's miners' objection to extractive capitalism and land exploitation. It shows minor families marching in protest through a tactic that will reappear in Cielo Abierto when clouds clear and Operación Diablo, the handheld camera moving inside the multitude as the miners are massacred by soldiers. The on-site recording of the screamed shots and overall confusion strengthens the documentary truth effect of the community Iraq. The use of long shots to capture the revolutionary collective and juxtapose it in, with close up of individualized police officers, company representatives, and government officials intensifies this contrast and places films like Courage of the People as the forerunner of decapitation resistance visualizations. All these documentaries make visible how local communities defend the right to inhabit a healthy and non-toxic land without contaminated water and or air, and where humans and non-humans live in a state of communal reciprocity, respect, and equality. Very rarely in these visualizations are the earth beings described by Marisol de la Cadena introduced as political agents. On the contrary, they appeal to the notion of buen vivir, a concept that connects ecological aspects to derive from the lifestyle of Andean communities based on a common experience that brings together humans and non-humans. Eduardo Budinas has developed this idea underscoring that the concept of Juan Vivir is not traditional but new and represents a particular way of relating to the natural world as well as an alternative perspective on developmentalism. In Derechos de la Naturaleza, Ética Biocéntrica y Políticas Ambientales, Gudinas appeals to the need to assign intrinsic values to nature in order to break away from an anthropocentric perspective that sees it objectively. By seeing nature in a non-extrinsic way and therefore subjectively, it is possible to assign rights to nature and the non-human world. Jorge Marcone has recently described how environmental documentaries frequently neglect to portray the more than human ontologies and temporalities associated with indigenous politics in Latin America. They usually focus on local resistance to national and transnational interests and on the exclusion of the indigenous peoples for national decision making. So why is this the case? Unlike literature, environmental documentaries focus less on the sacredness of a mountain, a river, or earth being, and more on environmental conflict itself. Furthermore, they don't directly address the environment from an ecological perspective. Instead, they tend to focus on the political and social conflicts that arise from the confrontation among different actors, transnational mining companies, local authorities, village dwellers. In doing so, these documentaries fail to introduce a gaze that critically inter interrogates the ecological relationship between humans and the more than human. By departing from an ontological perspective that pushes past the human, their vision remains limited to an anthropocentric position 
that unsuccessfully engages non-human agency as George Hanley and Elizabeth DeLaurie suggest. Such an approach would consider the ways in which ecology works outside of the frames of human time and political interest. They are to use Stephen Grass, Sama Monani, and Sean Covid's term, ecologically entangled in that they present people's daily activism and the relationship they have established with the land for many generations. However, as Ras Monani and Covid remark, media, society, and environment are inextricably entangled together, both in the way media texts represent environment and in the unavoidable manners that media texts and systems are materially embedded in natural resources, use and abuse. Decapitation resistance aims to make visible what is hardly noticeable or becomes unseen. With lack of visibility comes the question of scale. How can we grasp the immensity of these potential toxic genocides, most of which takes place in remote areas? Or, as Nixon inquired, what happens when we are on site, when, we, when what extends before us in the space and time that we most deeply inhabit remains invisible? The contribution of the documentaries examined here clearly speaks to a broader understanding of human interventions in environmental destruction. But, but they also, if we agree with Rust et al., that media consists of physical devices of mediation, permit both human and non-human words by destabilizing the idea of an absolute division between human society and our environment. The culturally constructed division between nature and culture emerged at the end of the 17th century with the establishment of the highly specialized and disciplined methods of knowledge production categorized as science, which, in turn, were frequently used to allow colonial expansionism and later on neocolonial development schemes such as resource extraction, deforestation, the construction of highways, roads and dams, among many other projects that displace human populations and exacerbate species collapse. In the documentaries, mining exploration and extractive politics of potential decapitation are framed literally and symbolically as the main thread in which the politics of mining stimulates environmental degradation, not only of the vernacular landscape, but also of the daily livelihood of local populations, thanks to the acid mine drainage, water pollution and scarcity, forest dead zones, and all sorts of disease, disease caused by mercury and cyanide exposure. As the threat of potential extraction becomes more real, the local community recurs to alternative knowledges that map the complexity and tension between extractive capitalism, environmental change, and regional cultural identity. While demands for environmental justice have become central to these struggles, although generally ineffective in stopping these policies, Sierra Vierto and Clouds Clear and Operación Diablo consist of a first attempt to decolonize and reverse the Western modernity project that aimed to discipline oil and non-European cultures. As stated above, they do not offer an appreciation of multinational worlds and of a pluriversal rather than universal understanding of the cosmos. But even when these cultural products, products fail to stop the imposed violence of extractive capitalism, they succeed in displaying what Martinez Salier has termed social metabolism and entropy. In other words, the flow of energy and materials that societies exchange with their environment, the stocks and flows recycling waste and emissions. To extract means to remove. Extraction can be described as capitalism fundamental logic of withdrawal as Matthew Henry has recently noted. This ranges from value, nutrients, energy, labor, time, as well as people, lands, culture, life forms, and the elements without corresponding deposit, except as externalities of non-value in the form of pollution, waste, climate change, illness, and death. 
those extern ex externalities are the built-in residues of extractive politics and capital. Devastated sites, such as those emptied out, decapitated mountains, abandoned after having been fully unearthed, now render useless from a profitable stand standpoint, as well as the vulnerable communities, also unprofitable, exposed to a toxic genocide, obliterated by the continued environment of the expanding frontier of extractivism. As Henry notes, this is an expansion that is characterized by the privatization and enclosure of the commons, displacement and deprivation, and an economy that goes regularly through periods of success followed by periods of failure. Martinez Salier suggests that in mining conflicts, as well as with oil pipelines and many other struggles, as we all have seen recently uh, in North America with the Standing Rock conflict in North Dakota, ethnic groups deploy vocabularies of human rights, livelihood, territorial rights for minorities, federalism, and environmentalism. <clears throat> it could be that strategically, it is preferable to inscribe their environmental claims within a longer history of progressive struggles. But it could also be that, as Martinez Ali has rightly demonstrated, when it comes to these legal battles, the weaker part must quickly attempt to understand the alien system of justice. We agree that there is no larger cultural difference in the world today than those between a CEO of a transnational corporation like Texaco or Freeport McMoran and tribal peoples in the Andes or Africa polluted by the water from oil extraction or by mine tailings dumped into rivers. The documentaries examined here point to the damages of both extractive capitalism and mining and the threat they pose to human and non-human rights and the local vernacular landscape. While they do not provide agency to non-human beings, decapitation resistance provides a critical tool for questioning hegemonic practices of power, as well as social, economic, and cultural exploitation. It offers a first venture towards the production of undisciplined knowledge, understood as a practice of contention and rebellion. It operates as a strategy of challenge, but also of survival. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, uh, as it used to be, very shocking uh, presentation of the uh, your, of your analysis of uh, the situation in, in Latin America, in this case, based on documentaries and, uh, and a lot of information of what's uh, going on. Uh, you have the possibility to uh, make questions in the Q and answers uh, function and uh, in the chat at the moment, I do not see any one. Um, so as you are thinking about uh, questions you, are, you want to make, uh, I would ask Gisela because I've heard um, her before, as I told initially, now she is uh, uh, a person uh, of, the, of the department. Uh, we, we, we are now sharing uh, interests uh, in a way that I didn't know that I had before. Um, and now you have analyzed documentaries and, and, and before I have heard and I have read the, your analysis of, of fiction. Uh, methodologically, how, how would you define the difference when, when you are working with one kind of uh, material and another? Fiction and documentaries uh, with, it, with these uh, issues, because you do uh, both very well. I'm, I'm so impressed that you have uh, so huge different uh, material when you are working. And uh, I expect now uh, more detailed questions in the in the chat and uh, Q and answer and of course Athena Gianfranco you have the privilege that you have voice so <laughs> if you don't uh, if you don't we don't get uh, other questions uh, you feel free to 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 make questions. Gisela. 
Yeah. Thank you, Ken, uh, for your question. Um, I think uh, methodologically, when you are analyzing documentaries, there are um, questions that arise that are not as um, urgent when you are analyzing fiction. And I would say that uh, the issue of gays, the issue of, of uh, who is uh, who is watching or how we are trying to position uh, the, the camera in, in the sense of how are we going to depict this unfolding conflict that we want to uh, describe uh, is very different in, in the context of, of, of literature. And I think presents questions uh, of the position of the, of, of the person who is, of the subject who is in charge. And, uh, and I think also uh, when you are analyzing films from a more uh, eco uh, or environmental perspective, not just you run into the problem of, uh, of the position of, of, of the gaze, which is something that occurs uh, no matter which type of film you're making. This is not something that is just an exclusive uh, concern for eco critics. But I think uh, you, can't, uh, you can move beyond and uh, ask other type of questions that are related to the much reality of the film per se. So how this, and that's why I was talking about the ecological, ecologically entangled uh, film comes from somewhere and that material uh, most of the time is also part of um, uh, an extracted material. So how do you, you negotiate uh, these two questions? The question of how you represent what you want to represent, but also how do you represent what you want to uh, convey in a way that is not perpetuating the cycle of extraction. So these are things that uh, come up more frequent uh, when you're analyzing uh, films, especially in the context of, uh, of uh, environmental humanities uh, that may not come necessarily when you're analyzing uh, fiction or poetry. Thank you very much. We now have a question from uh, Roberto Robaligno, uh, and he's wondering how the decaptation strategy uh, relates to other past mediatic ecological strategies in South America, such as, for example, the Cayapo struggle uh, against the buildings of Belomonte Dam in the Xingu River in the mid of the 80s, or maybe the water wars in, uh, in Bolivia. Yeah, I, I am I'm trying to use this idea of decapitation resistance as a tool, as a critical tool that could be uh, thought of a tool uh, as a way to further some sort of, uh, of uh, resistance. So every case will be different and they might use uh, different tools, but uh, what I, what I'm trying to kind of convey here is this idea of collective uh, empowerment in order to uh, move forward an agenda that is not related exclusively to uh, an ecological agenda, but just more simply uh, related to the right to live in a, a healthy land. And that's why I think uh, of, this, um, of this tool as a way that as a tool that could be thought of uh, in other different contexts. And when we are seeing collective uh, fights to date and, and manifestations, to some extent, you could say the same, uh, but I'm just really focused here in this particular case. So I will have to look case by case in order to have uh, the right uh, opinion, but I, so I cannot really talk, but I think like this is something that it could, it may be uh, uh, as a critical tool, uh, something that you may uh, use in other, to describe other type of conflicts. Thank you. Well, Maria Clara Medina uh, asked a question. 
which is related to, to my own uh, question in the beginning. Uh, would you say that the documentary film could be considered as part of the genre uh, testimonial ecology? And in that case, why? I did not say that the documentary can be part of the testimonial uh, ecology. No, she, she asked if you, uh, oh, oh, if you could consider it. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, there are some features of, depending on the films, there are some features that address uh, at some parts, in some parts, uh, uh, the the testimonial by the uh, by the communities that have been undergoing this um, these different conflicts. Uh, I'm not sure if I would place it in that category because um, there is always uh, the subject behind uh, conveying the story and. The, the, the idea of testimony per se is very complicated and very uh, problematic. So uh, I don't think I would uh, I would use that term to describe this film. I would just prefer to stay with documentary with uh, what it has, you know, as a as a as a complex genre itself, you know, and all the discussion about uh, uh, how a documentarist documents and registers uh, some events or reality per se, it's very uh, 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 problematic in itself. So I don't know if I will go a step uh, farther to call this testimon testimonial uh, ecologism. I don't remember exactly what, what word uh, she used, but uh, testimonial. Yes, testimonial uh, ecology. Yeah. Ecology. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see, we have a question from Nuno Marquez, uh, and it is, uh, well, everybody mm, appreciate very much and uh, thanks very much for, for the presentation, but I don't read that part. Huh? The idea of uh, resistance as uh, epistemology is very interesting. Uh, maybe you can comment on the ways in which resistant practices by local communities produce these other knowledges. Yeah, so this is, uh, uh, I would say that this is a knowledge that is uh, generated uh, in a, uh, I would say, grassroots manner. Uh, uh, instead of being a top down type of knowledge, uh, it's not a knowledge that is formed academically, it's not a knowledge that is um, um, acquired through institutions. On the contrary, what I think is interesting about this. Uh, in discipline or undisciplined knowledge is that is generated uh, because of the circumstances and is, is, is a knowledge that is generated is spontaneously, just uh, as the first kind of uh, feature, is generated uh, through exchange of community uh, information. So for instance, uh, you learn from these documentaries how uh, how the members of these collective groups uh, get together and start sharing information. Uh, because as I said, in many cases, they were not aware of, uh, of the risk of the of, uh, open, uh, open pit mines and other uh, type of extractive practices. So it's, 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 I would say it's a knowledge that is chaotic, it's a, it's, a, it's a knowledge that doesn't respond to the ways, norms, and orders that institutions organize knowledge for the good and for the bad. And it's also knowledge that is that questions the not just the institutional knowledge that is provided by the government and, uh, and the companies in compliance, right? Uh, and, with, uh, with some uh, corruption, of course, uh, and intentions of, of persuade the communities, but is a knowledge that is much more, um, uh, much more genuine in the sense that 
uh, has a very practical uh, end or goal, which is trying to uh, disassemble uh, this structure that is put in place by this uh, ongoing machinery, which is the alliance between uh, corrupted governments and transnational companies. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, to some extent, I would say it's, it's a very uh, decenter knowledge. It's not a knowledge that, it's not, it's not a, uh, 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 an indigenous knowledge. It's not a different type of epistemology. I'm not talking about that. Uh, it's the knowledge that is produced in a different way, uh, almost out of desperation and survival, as I said at the end. It's the knowledge that uh, is created uh, in haste, basically <laughs> trying to stop uh, the, the uh, ongoing, uh, the unfolding of this, of this uh, exploration. So it has uh, many uh, uh, features that make it uh, undisciplined because it doesn't respond to any discipline in the proper sense, but also some discipline because it, it, it carries with it some, uh, some rebellious uh, aspirations. Thank you. Josef uh, Weger is um, uh, wondering if you could speak more to the employment of human rights uh, discourse for an ecology, ecologically focused agenda, despite the plurality of seres sintientes as the premise to rethink politics, that is uh, the positives or negatives of uh, strategic inscription in, uh, in this tradition. Uh, I could not hear the first part of the question. Would you mind repeating? Yeah. Uh, he's wondering if, if you could speak more uh, to the employment of the uh, human rights discourse uh, for an ecologically, <laughs> ecologically focused uh, agenda, uh, despite the plurality of uh, series and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, in terms of human rights, I would, uh, uh, I would say that they appeal uh, to this idea of Juan Vivir that I mentioned, uh, because this idea of Juan Vivir is not an ancient idea or notion, but uh, a new notion uh, that tries to kind of contest uh, the idea of, or the notion of, uh, of development and progress. And this is important because uh, in, in many of these assemblies that I mentioned, the counter discourse that came up by the institutional uh, and official uh, members are is, is this idea, uh, this recurrent idea of, uh, of progress that this mining and explorations will bring jobs to uh, local population and that it will bring uh, more assets and, and, and uh, the province or the town is going to grow, which is all fake uh, because uh, as we know, those, uh, the, the, the assets of those, of those extractions don't stay in their local environments. And most of the time, the local communities uh, have to, uh, are displaced because, um, because of all the uh, all the drainage of the water that is used uh, uh, for for mining, which is twenty four seven a day uh, uh, all the time, but um, so so human rights come handily as a, as a notion when we talk about the rights of nature, uh, which is something that some sociologists and anthropologists have been uh, moving forward as a as this idea of assigning value to nature uh, to make it uh, intrinsically. So if, uh, if you, if you, uh, if you uh, assign value to nature, then you can uh, definitely treat it as a, as a persona juridica, which means that they can have the same rights that other human beings. So uh, in, in, in that case, there is this idea of uh, of acquiring or or, or or trying to acquire some uh, 
rights to nature that would make it more, uh, more difficult to continue the exploitation. Uh, but I do think that we're still uh, a little bit far from there. So uh, that's a great attempt and we have to move in that direction, but uh, it's not really happening uh, except uh, as many of you know in, in Ecuador when they, uh, they declared that the constitution, uh, uh, that nature in the constitution that nature was part of uh, the Pachamama. But uh, other than that, uh, we're still kind of far from there. Thank you. We take uh, the last question because before we, we make uh, a break and begin with the parallel sessions. And it is from uh, Montserrat Madariaga Caro, uh, who would like to know your take on indigenous fight for territorial and cultural autonomy. What is uh, in the Turtles Island, Island called land back movement? Uh, do the indigenous communities depicted in the films uh, are they working towards that? And uh, do the creators of the documentaries engage with this? That's the question. Yeah, so uh, generally speaking, uh, the, so the, well, first, what is my take on, on the, um, on the indigenous movement to uh, get back their lands? I think they should. Uh, they they were there. They, it's a it's a long struggle, but uh, I think uh, is is important to support that type of of, of struggle. Um, uh, in the documentaries, there is not such distinction between indigenous and non-indigenous. These are usually peasants and farmers and local peoples that uh, inhabit a particular uh, uh, town or, or or city, and they are uh, at risk of of uh, of of losing basically their livelihood. So there is not such distinction as this is not these documentaries don't. Are not looking at uh, uh, a post-anthropocentric gaze. They're not. They're not trying to. Um, they're not trying to uh, engage uh, uh, exclusively with indigenous uh, struggles or fights. Uh, however, what I think is important is that in these fights, there are people coming from different backgrounds. So you have indigenous, but you have also local people that are not not indigenous, you have some activists and they're all uh, fighting for the same type of uh, goal, which is to stop that exploration, to ask these people to leave and to leave them alone and to continue doing uh, their typical uh, farming and which is sometimes walnuts, sometimes it could be uh, uh, grapes uh, in, some, uh, in some cases. So there is not such a distinction. And I think that's important too, because uh, in a way, um, what shows you is that you can, uh, this kind of uh, collaborative uh, movement, this collective movement that aims to uh, push forward this undisciplined knowledge uh, can be a way also of, 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 of a, a collective of voices uh, beyond distinctions, beyond uh, of, um, whether you are indigenous or not. Obviously, everybody has different interests, but in this particular uh, case, these three case studies, uh, the, the, the aim is to stop the exploration and the tool to use to move forward is, uh, is through this kind of collective action, which is uh, a collective action where uh, people are coming from different backgrounds not just indigenous or non-indigenous. Thank you very much. Uh, what a marvelous beginning of this uh, workshop. Uh, thank you, Gisela, for uh, your presentation and uh, the answers uh, of, of these uh, questions. And thank you very much for, for uh, the questions from, from the audience. And um, now we make a break until 14.30, uh, 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 local time here in, in Stockholm. And remember that you have the, to choose the links because we are going to have parallel sessions. So you must uh, choose the link A or the link B.
thank you again and uh, see you in uh, some minutes. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. See you. Bye.